Well, because they take the threat very seriously and they have learned from, from very, very serious tragedies and of course others will point out because they are small. Um, they also tend to be very expensive. What they do is they hand search all the luggage, they know what's going on to the plane. You get asked many, many questions, not did you pack your own bag. And by the way, other carriers and other airports do that too. Several European question, uh, airlines and airports question you in depth when you're traveling and do much greater security screening. But El Al also has um, literally uh, fortified planes, hardened luggage containers. They have a double door to the cockpit. So, uh, you know, people are talking about putting an absolute fail-safe locked cockpit door for the uh, flight deck and the flight personnel. But on a long flight, obviously, they're going to come out for human reasons. Uh, so LL has solved that with a double door. The pilots can come out and use the restroom facilities, and there's still another door between them and, and the cockpit. But that won't do it alone. You also have to have the policies that go along with that, because even a double locked door, um, a pilot who has a responsibility for the safety and well-being of everyone on that plane, at least in our country, we're blessed with pilots who, you know, care enough about their uh, passengers to come out. We will have to have policies that say you can't come out. So the locked door may not solve that um, uh, entirely either, but El Al just go goes, you know, to great lengths to secure um, the passengers. And uh, nobody's hijacked one of those in a long time, have they, if ever? No, but then they learned from some terrible tragedies sure. and uh, decided simply to make their people safe. Literally, if we opened up an El Al airline tomorrow, the airline would be flush with business. Not that Americans want to give up flying. We are a nation of flying. We conduct our business on the airplane. I mean, some of us work in three locations across the country. And this is difficult on everyone, but people don't feel safe. And if you want to save the airlines, the best thing you can do for the airlines is make it safe. So the, the objections to the cost and the delays are actually very counterproductive to the carriers. Um, if we made them safe, um, it would be a much better situation for them in the long run. Much All right. better. More, more to come with Mary Schiavo, who's a uh, former Department of Transportation Inspector General. It's 12.32 uh, in the East, and time to get caught up on the uh, very latest news developments in connection with all this. Here's Gary Cutley. Thanks, Jack. Uh, well, now a second person is being held as a material witness in connection with Tuesday's terrorist attacks. The man had been held by U.S. Immigration Services, and he's been questioned thoroughly, no doubt, by the FBI. Another development on Saturday, New York officials revealed at a news conference here in the city that a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. No other details were given, but the discovery prompted the FBI and police to expand their, the search area down in lower Manhattan. President George W. Bush has been meeting with key advisors at Camp David in the Maryland Mountains, and he is warning the American public, quote, as we know now, we are at war, unquote. He labeled Osama bin Laden as the top suspect in the attacks. And he's told the military, he's given the military a simple order, get ready. And in New York City, the number of people believed buried under the ruins has now been raised to nearly 5,000. But the digging, the searching, the hoping continues. Mayor Rudy Giuliani says he is holding out only slight hope that survivors can still be found. On Saturday, as on Friday, as on Thursday, nobody was. Only 159 bodies of those nearly 5,000 have been recovered. And at the Pentagon, 187 people are missing, and they are presumed lost. Funerals are beginning now, four days after the attacks. And mourners gathered Saturday as New York buried three of its top fire department officials. Up to 300 firefighters are believed to have died in the city. And slowly, as far as air transport is concerned, air travel is resuming across the land. Boston's Logan Airport, where two of Tuesday's planes took off, reopened on Saturday. The three major airports in the New York City area are operating, but very sharply reduced capacities. John F. Kennedy Airport, LaGuardia, and Newark International resumed, serv resumed services on Friday. One airliner that was hijacked on Tuesday, of course, took off from Newark across the river from Manhattan here. Well, Tuesday's hijackings turned airplanes into flying bombs. Perhaps that was the perverted genius of the terrorists. And now a group representing the people who fly those planes is advising its members to take a firm stand. Here's Gene Meserve. For pilots, the rule of thumb in hijackings has always been be passive, be cooperative, get on the ground and into negotiations. Tuesday, the rules changed instantaneously. Commercial pilot Paul Emmons was in the air. And uh, my co-pilot and I basically looked at each other and said, you want to fly or fight? And he was, had his big steel flashlight and 
Uh, if anybody came through the door, he was going to go after him, and I was going to get the airplane on the ground. According to the Airline Pilots Association, pilots and flight attendants, the airlines, the FAA, and law enforcement are engaged in an unprecedented cooperative effort to improve aircraft security quickly. We are at war, and we're taking it, treating it that way, and everybody's cutting through the red tape, making decisions. Among the changes being considered on an expedited basis, whether to provide law enforcement escorts, whether to arm pilots with weapons, and how to modify equipment like the cockpit door so it is a more effective barrier. This new door that we want for, well, I hope by Friday, really by Friday, I want a certification process approved by the FAA and the manufacturer in ALPA, and I believe we can have that, and then on our way to getting that door. Some airlines have told their pilots to do what they must to save themselves, their aircraft, and their passengers. Pilot Paul Emmons says if his plane is under threat, passengers better hold on. You should be wearing your seatbelt. What does that mean? We can start to maneuver that aircraft so that uh, he cannot uh, function. Depressurize? We can depressurize the aircraft, we can throw it around the sky, we can do all sorts of things, and he won't be walking when it's over. Despite the financial distress of the airline industry, the Airline Pilots Association says no security measure is off the table, no matter what the expense. But some aviation watchdogs are critical. They say the problems and the solutions were known long ago, and they ask, why are we seeing corrections so late, too late? Jean Meserve, CNN, Washington. And, uh, Jack, a moment ago you were talking about the impossibility of knowing who these terrorists are before the terrorist act is actually carried out, which is not, not exactly right. Not totally true. Uh, CNN is reporting now that two of the, of the suspects of this, these terrorist attacks were on a, an, a watch list. These are lists that in U.S. intelligence puts together, and these are people you're supposed to keep your eyes on. And indeed, one of them was actually under surveillance, uh, picked up by a surveillance camera when he was meeting in Kuala Lumpur. That's in Malaysia, Southeast Asia. Long trip to take. Right. Meeting with a person who was suspected to have been involved in the bombing of the USS Cole, which killed 17 uh, Navy uh, men, wow. uh, men and women. So the fact is there is a watch list out there. Sometimes these names are known. The question is, can you follow them 24 hours a day? You know, years ago, you remember when Carmine Galati was killed here in New York City and he was uh, shot down in the courtyard of a restaurant in Brooklyn and I was working at local news of Channel 4 at the time and we raced to the scene and we got this live remote up and he too was being followed. He'd just gotten out of prison and the FBI was uh, trailing him and he was under surveillance and of course his enemies got him anyway in the courtyard of this restaurant. So I'm doing a live remote with Chuck Scarborough, who was the anchor at Channel 4 in New York back at the studio. And when I get all finished, uh, we were live on the air, and Chuck said, well, if the FBI was watching him, why was he killed? Well, that's, this is the good question. Yeah. The answer, obviously, is that there are so many of these suspects out there. How much manpower do you have? And are they now going to authorize and budget the manpower and right. the effort to track all of these people? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's not only uh, the list. It's communication between these federal agencies, yeah. between themselves. I mean, we, we've seen cases here in this country where Customs had one guy, couldn't communicate to the FBI. We saw it in one of these serial killers a couple of months back. Mm. So it's the communication between these thousands of people who are being watched, who enter the country each day, and whether the FBI gets the information out to local law enforcement, and that's a major problem. You know, one thing we failed to realize here, we're going to be fighting on a front inside this country, yeah. and uh, we're going to have to use the military in a different way than we ever used before. I mean, in, in a sense, you're... think about this, you know, posse comitatus, you yeah. know, if you're going to fight a war against terrorism, you have a front inside the United States. You actually have these cells operating here, not just five years, back as much as 15 years ago, they've set up shop in this country. And you're going to have to have a concerted effort by law enforcement. You've got 50,000 different law enforcement agencies. How do you coordinate that effort? So you're going to need one agency to do this. I think a federal agency, you need some military manpower. This might think, have us rethink the use of military assets right. both outside the country and inside the country. Gary in Missouri, um, what can we do for you? How are you this evening? I'm good. Are they still charging five dollars a gallon for gasoline out there? I have heard some ugly stories. I used to work in Kansas City years ago and I heard that uh, within hours after this happened there were some opportunists that jacked up the price of the pump to four and five dollars. That's not still going on, is it? of Missouri law, so it brought them right back into check real quick. Okay, good. What can we uh, help you with? I, I guess my concern and my next question is, uh, I did several years in the United States Navy. I, I see that there is a big concern as regards to the commercial airline safety. 
what are we doing in regards to private airlines? I, I just think of myself here in St. Charles, Missouri. Mm-hmm. There's several different private airlines. It's very accessible to Cessna aircraft and, and other smaller aircraft. What are we doing about those? It's little airports all over the country, that's a good point, that contain uh, virtually unwatched aircraft that are sitting tethered. Uh, you hop a fence, and if you know Absolutely. what you're doing, you can be airborne in 10 minutes. What about that? Very little watching going on. Yeah. I mean, uh, even during the Persian Gulf War, I myself went to one of those private aircraft uh, out on Long Island, walked right on a tarmac, got on a plane. I mean, so, uh, you know, again, uh, there's, what, 400 or some odd airports in the United States? Uh, How do we ratchet up security with the system that's not working now? How do you put extra layers on that, you know? It's an absurd system that we have, and I think uh, Mary said it before, uh, and I would go one step further. I think we must develop a federal force. You know, somebody that watches our borders also has to watch the people go in. I don't That's think the, all the immigration hey, policies. I, yeah, but I don't now. think the FAA uh, hasn't shown any ability to do this. They, they've been more puffing the airlines uh, sure. uh, rather than uh, watching them. I think you need some agency like um, the United States Customs. It's not a plug for Customs. What about uh, Customs or the Coast Guard, Mary? Do either of those make any sense? Uh, they both make sense, and I was actually very fortunate to work with both of them when I worked aviation crimes as the inspector general. The customs was a very reliable uh, law enforcement counterpart when we worked international cases on bogus parts and other aviation crimes. But I'm rather partial to the Coast Guard for a couple very real reasons. The Coast Guard is in the Department of Transportation, so it would provide seamless transportation coverage. And the Coast Guard already has jurisdiction over the ports, and most airports are ports. In fact, you know, uh, Port of New York, New Jersey, Port Columbus, et cetera. And they are trained. They're already trained in law enforcement. Uh, Many of them are trained in drug interdiction. They have a fleet of aircraft. They are very experienced in overwater uh, operations. They already do our aircraft down in water, search and rescue. They're very familiar with the uh, rules. Um, And the most important thing about the Coast Guard is they're already used to dealing with the transportation public because they're responsible for the oversight enforcement and law enforcement against uh, uh, bad boaters and and, uh, protecting boaters, which outnumber pilots and aircraft. So they're extremely experienced, and, um, you know, they can do an amazing job with very little. Um, I'm uh, very high on the Coast Guard. All right, good. Uh, Mary, we'll get back to you in a moment. What I'd like to do, if we can, Gary Tuckman has been uh, reporting uh, all day today and all night tonight on the ongoing uh, search and rescue, which are rapidly becoming search and recovery uh, efforts going on at uh, what uh, we have dubbed Ground Zero, uh, the news media. This is uh, where the World Trade Center came down. Uh, The pictures you see on television, we'll switch to Gary here in just a moment, don't really, uh, I think, begin to tell the story of the size, the dimension of the of the uh, rubble removal task that is uh, faced by the city of New York. As of this afternoon, the city had removed about 13,000 tons, 13,000 tons of rubble from the World Trade Center site. That's less than 1%. The World Trade Center, 110 stories tall, contained, these are staggering numbers, 200,000 tons of steel, 425,000 cubic yards of concrete, and 14 acres of windows. So let's get an update from Gary Tuckman at Ground Zero in downtown New York on what's going on down there tonight and perhaps more importantly how the spirit and resolve of these dedicated people is holding up. Gary? Jack, I'll tell you, when you talk about spirit and resolve, the people who have been working here have it in abundance. But the problem is they've had absolutely no good news over the last three days. A few survivors were found on Tuesday, a few on Wednesday. Since then, not one survivor has been found. Behind me, you can see the smoke is still billowing. It's billowing because the fires continue to break out. They put out a fire in one place, then they remove steel in another place that provides oxygen to that area, and another fire breaks out. So you see the situation there. It's still very dangerous for the rescue workers, and they have no good news to tell over the last three days. They're still hopeful there could possibly be survivors, but they haven't found any for more than 72 hours. Jack? And isn't the conventional wisdom, Gary, that in a situation like this, the first 48 hours is absolutely critical, and after that, the survival rate drops off to uh, almost nothing? Survival rate drops down very low, but there certainly is precedent for finding people a week or two later from earthquakes all over the world. But there's also precedent to show that it's unlikely in the sense that during the Oklahoma City disaster, they were hopeful they would find survivors, and they did the day of, they did the day after, and nobody after that. All right, Gary Tuckman at Ground Zero. Uh, the uh, list of the missing and people who are uh, 
expected that at some point they will recover uh, their bodies and identify them as approaching 5,000. Uh, maybe it's worth thinking about for a moment that the World Trade Center, the capacity of those two buildings was 50,000. 